When we're ready to sing, we step up at the microphones and it comes out something like this. We came in the studios with Levi's and T-shirts, smoking cigarettes. The older guys were saying they're going to wreck the music business. In the hardcore producing area, everybody knew what went on there. I mean, everybody knew that the best musicians played in all the sessions, but we as the general public didn't know. They played so well, and they played so well together. I was in awe then because of Phil Spector. I pulled my car over the side of the road and said, what am I listening to here? The musicians were really the unsung heroes of all those hit records. When I listen to the record, it is so apparent that these guys were just really so good. And you can see why everybody used them. The Wrecking Crew was the focal point of the music. They were the ones with all the spirit and all the know-how. We made up a lot of arrangements ourselves. We would either augment or totally replace a group. The public was oblivious that there was a secret star maker machinery. I had no idea that people didn't play their own records until the monkeys came along. We were so busy. I was making more money than the president of the United States. Seven records of the year. It was unbelievable. Here's the way that the beat goes on, sound when we first heard it. La -di da da da. Yeah, I said, uh oh. The third line I came up with was. The beat goes on. They were the stone cold rock and roll professionals, and there may never be a group of that caliber again. Hello, this is Nice Wander, and welcome to the Now Man Show. Uh, Denny Tedesco is a producer and director who grew up in Los Angeles and graduated from Loyola Marymount University. He started his film career as a set decorator for films such as Eating Raul and has worked around the world as a lighting technician and location producer for IMAX Films. He conducts interviews for Annie Biography, TV Land, and Comedy Central. For over a decade now, he's produced commercials, videos, and promos, including the 2000 Academy Awards opening segment with Billy Crystal and the Elton John music video, I Want Love, starring Robert Downey Jr. In 2014, he released his documentary, The Wrecking Crew, about the great session players, including his father, Tommy Tedesco, and the rest of the crew that created the music behind the Beach Boys, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, the Monkees, TV show theme songs, and so much more. Denny Tedesco, welcome to the Thank Now you. Man Show. Thank you. Um, now, you grew up in a household with a father who was a world-class session musician. I, I did, but you know, it was just like any other dad. Yeah. I mean, everybody assumes it was like a hoot nanny at our house, you know, a lot of music and yeah. you know, rock and roll and all that. But the truth is, dad just went to work like everybody else. He, uh, I didn't see, I was born in 61, so mm -hmm. I didn't see my dad play guitar at home and for himself until 74, 75. Really? Maybe even 76, because he wow. did jazz albums then. Because he was going to work when we were kids, he was going to work 10, 12, 14 hours a day just playing, so he didn't need to practice. So when he got home, it was, you know, be with the kids, be with the family, watch football, yeah. card game, or whatever it was, but it wasn't music. So I, I had a different life than other people think I did. Yeah, yeah. Did, did, did you want to play music? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I wanted to play a lot of music. I, I, uh, I could have been a one-man band with all the things I took. <laughs> uh, guitar, piano, saxophone at Notre Dame High School. That was to get out of typing class. I uh, never actually <laughs> played with the band. Uh, accordion, I quit that too. No, I'm a quitter. You're a quitter. I was a quitter, <laughs> I can't play an instrument now. So what, so what made you uh, actually wanna get into the film business? Um, that's interesting. I, when I was in high school at Notre Dame in Sherman Oaks, I, uh, I got cast in a uh, Pizza Hut commercial. <laughs> so uh, that was my uh, touch of uh, acting and you know, thought I wanted to go that way. And um, 
did that and it was fun and I was doing plays and then I went to um, Loyola Marymount for a production and I wanted to be a writer there. I was trying to write scripts and you know wrote a few scripts and you know optioned one but I wasn't a writer. I was mm. you know same thing with uh, musicians. You have to do it every day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, if you don't mm -hmm. have that love of doing it every day, a writer needs to write every day. Uh, uh, a musician plays every day, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whether or not, you know, but they have to do it, and I, that wasn't me. So um, this is actually the Wrecking Crew, I started in 96, you know, the story about my father and his friends, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, it wasn't until this year that we got it out. Wow. So there's part of that is the back backstory of quitting all those other things. I thought, I can't quit this. And eventually you knew you would get to that story. Yeah. So at the beginning, um, you became a, a location manager. Well, I was actually right. gripping and lighting at the mm -hmm. time, and uh, IMAX Films, when I started doing that, I did that for a few years. And then uh, 96, my dad was diagnosed with cancer, and it was terminal cancer, and I was in, I just remember them saying he doesn't have much time, and I wanted to do something about the crew. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. we quickly put together a round table like this and uh, just started shooting. And um, it was a wonderful, um, wonderful day. So, um, when you, to get back, before we go on to the wrecking crew, yeah. um, what was it like doing the, the IMAX films? You must have had a, a lot, lot of adventures. I um, loved it, loved yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, you know what it was, because I, why I loved it so much was there was only three or four of us sometimes at a mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We would go, the first job was going to Japan, you know, to wow. do volcanoes. Really? And there was, you know, a volcano down there that it was a, called Ring of Fire. It was like, I thought I was never gonna get that job, you know, but I got the job. But why I loved it so much is because you became part of decision making. And, you know, when you're 33% of the crew, you know, you go, oh, look at that. And we all look, <laughs> yeah. and, you know. Yeah. Versus, you know, in town here, you know, you're just throwing a sandbag sometimes. It mm -hmm. wasn't so much fun. Um, but I got to uh, learn how to dive. Great Whites was my second dive in wow. Australia. You know, spent three weeks on a boat there. Went to China or Taiwan. Um, went to uh, Alaska to do uh, up and down the state. You know, filming grizzlies and polar bears and everything. Wow. And Serengeti in Africa was my favorite. Wow. You know, spent uh, a good three, three or four months there on and off throughout the year watching the migration. The migration of? of wildebeest. Wildebeest. Wow. So we would, you know, just sit out in the bush just waiting for them to cross a river. And, and sometimes you just started rooting after two weeks, no, nothing happened. You start rooting for the crocodiles. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just got like, come on, do something. What, what was, uh, you say that was your favorite? I think so, it's just, it was an amazing, I mean, I was able to do things I thought there's no way I could ever do in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to be, you know, sitting in, you know, in Africa or in Alaska, in the top of, you know, Barrel, Alaska, you know, just sitting on the ice. Wow. You know, so I was very fortunate. You know, I loved it. And then you, you, uh, you, you also did interviews. Uh, yeah, I mean, what it, it, well, it started, the interview started because once I stopped doing IMAX films, I started producing some rock and roll videos for a couple friends here and there. And someone recommended me to a job on Comedy Central. Uh, it was a show called Pulp Comics, which was a fantastic show. And it was basically uh, stand-up comics would do their stand-up in New York. And then we would do the films that really, it's, Amy, it's like Amy Schumer's uh, show right now. And you would do the films that related to the stand-up. And mm -hmm. I got to meet Dana Gould, who's fabulous, and uh, David Allen Greer and uh, Margaret Cho, and it was fun. And that started my producing career. So I went that way into comedy and then uh, started doing a lot of comedy stuff for producing for a game show network, as well as uh, Comedy Central, where we do promos for them. I loved it, you know. Comics, I have a, um, I have a, a soft spot for comics because I feel it like musicians, you know, there's something that they're putting themselves out there. But I think comics have to do it even more because, you know, a musician can play in a club, and you know, for the pe they don't have to pay attention to them. That's right. Comic, God help that person. <laughs> you know, he or she better get some response. You know? Exactly. 
So I have a soft spot for them. Excellent. And so you uh, you actually got an Emmy nomination for a segment that you did oh, right. for the they, Academy Awards in 2000 they, with Billy they Crystal. Got a, they had an Emmy nomination. It was uh, it was I was recommended to come and be the outside producer of this show called uh, the Billy Crystal film. They called it. It was when Billy came back after a few years, and uh, to do the opening. And Billy had already done those two openings where he put himself into the five films nominees. And I think this was 2000, if I'm correct. They wanted um, the top 15 films, um, you know, of the century. Wow. So we, you know, put Billy in uh, with um, with Charlie Chaplin in The Godfather, <laughs> and it was it was fun. Wow. You know, and that was the stuff that doesn't make it to at the writers' table that doesn't make it to the film. It's always much funnier. It's pretty yeah, funny. I think I remember seeing that. That was very well done. I mean, that was, uh, you know, uh, Dakota Films did that, and um, they were they were they were the ex they were the guys that did all that stuff. They knew how to do it. I just helped, you know, wa you know, just make sure it got together. What was it like working with Elton John and Robert Downey? I Jr.? didn't work with Elton. Oh, you that, didn't? No, it was interesting. Uh, the Elton John video. Uh, again, was one of those jobs where it came out of nowhere. It was a recommendation. Somebody from England called, said, um, it was somebody we knew, said, hey, can you, it's Thursday, can you cover me on a producing job on Tuesday? I said, sure, what is it? Well, it's um, Elton John video. I said, oh, right. well, wow, that's great, but Elton's not in it. Okay. And then she went on to say, I said, well, is it prepped? Is it ready to go? She goes, no. I said, but it shoots on Tuesday. <laughs> and it was basically, the story is it's one shot from beginning to end, and she says, it's, all it is is just one shot. You know, the actor is going to sing to the part. I said, who's the actor? And she said, Robert Downey Jr. I said, Robert's in jail right now. He's in rehab. I mean, you know, just after <laughs> Alec McBeal. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, well, they're going to let him out for this. I said, oh, no. And it was great, wow. but it's like, are you kidding me? We had to prep and shoot that in uh, literally three days, had to get it together. And it worked out. It was one of the most, uh, if you get a chance, listen to that song. It's, it's um, gut-wrenching, because it's, especially with Robert's lip sync in it, you believe he's singing it. It's a beautiful song. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. Now, um, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the Wrecking Crew. Sure. So we're going to take a little break, and we'll be right back. Oh, this is Now Man. I am the superhero of the present moment and the host of The Now Man Show. I'm Andrew Keegan, and when I'm in LA, I watch The Now Man Show. We have all kinds of interesting stuff. Education. Think about it. Entertainment. Hi, my name is Erica Podest, and I'm a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And next time I'm in Pasadena, I'll be checking out The Now Man Show. Music, film, get down, get funk. Eh? Hi, my name is Philip Carrillo. I'm a filmmaker. And each time I'm in Los Angeles, I'm watching The Now Man Show. We're on location. Hi, I'm John Fuglesang, and when I'm in LA, I like to buy lots of shoes and not walk any place. But also, I like to watch The Now Man Show because it is better than the best show on all of TV. The Now Man Show is also on YouTube. No! All right, back here with uh, Denny Tedesco. As uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, his father, Tommy Tedesco, was an acclaimed studio session musician. Um, and you did a film called The Wrecking Crew, which you produced, co-produced, I should say, and directed, correct? Right. Uh, and now it's in, in theaters, it's getting outstanding reviews, it's actually an award-winning documentary. Congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely, I love it. And so we're going to watch an outtake right now to start this conversation with Leon Russell huh. talking about working with George Harrison. I was playing on one of George Harrison's records one day. And we were in, a, in take 168. And I went up to him and said, George, do you want me to play the same thing 168 times or do you want me to play 168 different things? It was just driving me crazy. I didn't, I didn't like to do that. But some people, I mean, he was overdubbing on, on my wedding album. I had one of his songs on there. He just played a guitar solo. And it was great. 
I said, well, that's good. And he said, oh, no, that's not quite good. Let me play it again. So he played, I had 40 track machine, and he played 25 more solos. I kept all of them. We got to the end of solo 25, and I said, well, George, listen to this one, see what you think. I played it, and he said, well, that's great. What is that? And I said, that's number one. All right, Leon. Yeah, phenomenal <laughs> guy. Yeah. So you, you interviewed him towards the end of the production? Yeah, absolutely. See, I started, like I said earlier, I think I started in 96. What happened was when we started this film, um, I tried everywhere to try to get funding. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in 1998, Dad died in 97, so I kept going with this 14-minute piece. And everybody said, this is great, but you'll never get it made. And they said two reasons. One, you're never going to get the publishers and the record companies to come together to be part of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And second of all, the um, cost it will be for the music itself will be much higher than a documentary could ever make. So that's a lost cause. So I had to keep on going for, it was about 10 years and my wife finally figured out, well, she didn't figure out, we knew, <laughs> but did we just make the most expensive home movie ever? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, it was like, what do we do? And I described it as having a property overlooking this wonderful beach and you have nothing but the property. You have the plans, you have the appliances, uh, uh, you know, everything, but you can't, until you build it, you have no idea if you can sell it. So we got uh, Claire Scanlon, who's a wonderful editor, and now she's a director on TV. She came on and she helped, you know, she uh, edited it and helped me produce it. And um, so 2008, we got into the festivals. Did extremely well, but no one would touch us because we still had at least seven hundred thousand dollars worth of, you know, uh, licensing, and I just had to keep on going. No one, you know. Finally, it was two thousand ten. We started doing donations. Mm. We came up with donation ideas. If you uh, uh, pick a song in the film, you could for a thousand dollars, you could put a dedication on it, and Great. that started it. So it was like putting a name on into a bl building, and. We raised uh, over half a million dollars wow. between you know five dollars, ten dollars, up to fifty thousand dollars. You know, people That's fantastic. helped out, but it took many years, and um, you know, I'm really proud of it. And then Leon, we interviewed Leon uh, in 2012, I think it was. You know, so the film had already done the festivals, but I was still hoping to get this released. And when we did Kickstarter, which was our last thing we did in 2013 which was to raise money to pay off the musicians union, which they got paid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. We were able to use the money, some of the money to add Leon's interview in. That's excellent. It's phenomenal. I mean, Leon, people don't realize, Leon and Glenn Campbell were two of the greatest session players of all time. Yes. But, you know, they were the only ones really that became stars. Exactly. You know, went on their own. And Leon was like Leon. He just says it like it is. He was, you know, I asked him, I said, um, I said, were you ever bored? He said, oh, I was bored all the time. Yeah, yeah, he was he bored said, all the he time. He says, I'd be sitting there doing the tracks and there's no lyrics, you know, we're just yeah, doing yeah. the tracks. He says, yeah. after the 10th time, I've got it memorized in my head. He says, I start writing lyrics in my head. Exactly. Of what this song, maybe it was going to be, you know, a Sonny and Cher song, but he's writing his own lyrics. Exactly. So. And, and your father, uh, Tommy yeah. Tedesco, was described by a guitar player's uh, magazine as possibly the most recorded Guitars in yeah. history, right? I mean, yeah, one time it probably could have been, yeah. Because, you know, Dad had a specialty. He was a session player. Um, when I say that, I mean because he could play multiple instruments. Mm -hmm. He would do, um, he could play a uh, mandolin, a bazooki, banjo. Um, sitar. A, a sit, electric ukulele. Sitar. Yeah, electric sitar. Electric right? sitar. Yeah, yeah. Um, ukulele. It didn't matter. He said, if it had a string, I'll play it. <laughs> as long as I, he said, I tune it, and I'm not a guitar player, but guitar players understand. I tune every instrument like a guitar. You know, he said, if I could tune a shovel like a guitar, I will. Wow. You know, and the reason was, then he knew where he was on the fretboard. Mm. So if he's, you know, if he said, I, listen, it's not the traditional tuning, mm -hmm. but how am I going to tell John Williams if I'm lost because I'm traditional tuning and I'm lost, how am I going to tell him, but it's right? It's not right. It doesn't sound right. <laughs> exactly. So his job is to get it right. How did he inspire you, would you say? You know, it's funny because people assume I play and I don't, as we said. Um, he inspired me how he treated so many people. Uh, he inspired me, you know, people tell me stories about him. They were phenomenal. Um, he inspired me uh, to never give up and really be smart. 
about how things went if you, to read a room. He could read the room better than anybody. And uh, I think that's what kept me alive for 19 years making this. Wow. You know, he said, never blow up on the leader, meaning like, hey, you could be 110% right about the argument going on, but you blow up on the guy, he's not going to bring you back the next day. And there was, that kept me straight for those 19 years when I was negotiating with labels and publishers or whoever, you know, because guess what? You know, six years later or 10 years later, I'm talking to that person again. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so we, luckily I never lost it. And then when, once it was in film festivals, it started getting, getting traction, right? So Yeah, well, it got traction, but it was a, a darling. That's all it was, was the darling of the music community, darling mm -hmm. of uh, festivals. But it didn't mean anything because no one would touch us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Literally, it wasn't until I called Magnolia and said, hey, we're paid up. And they said, oh, really? Yeah. Because you know, no one knew it. They, people thought it was out. And it changed from the original as well. So. There was a lot of changes that came and out. And didn't Claire uh, say, who is your editor and, uh, and co-producer, didn't she say at one point, like, stop interviewing people? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, was, that was one of the things that Claire said when she came on. And, you know, because don't forget, I had already done 10 years, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I was still interviewing people. She said, you can't keep interviewing people. I said, but, and she, and she was right. She said, you can't put everybody into this. I said, I know, but, because you'll never fall in love with these characters. You need mm -hmm. to know who these mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said, but that's why God gave us DVDs. I said, I will put it on the DVD somehow. And even a couple days ago, I uh, interviewed Bobby Hart of Boys and Heart. Oh, wow. Great. I just feel it's historically, I want these things down, even if it's, you know, for YouTube or whatever. If I have a chance to talk to someone, let's put it on. And while these people are still here, uh, get them on film. Yeah, you know, and, and I was you can lucky. always do additional films. Exactly. And part and, you two, know, part three, or yeah, however know, you need to we'll do. We'll see about that. <laughs> uh, but I was really happy because I wanted the voices. I wanted their voices. Uh, on the DVD, there's six hours of extra bonus material, which I had to beg Magnolia to do. And it was like, they have we have Petula Clark, uh, uh, Richard Carpenter, Bill Medley, uh, Barry McGuire, James Burton, um, all, many of the other artists in it, Engineers Chapter. There's a producer's chapter. Well, let's finish this segment sure. with uh, a clip okay. that uh, actually has your father in it. And uh, Leon Russell is, is uh, telling, uh, well, actually everybody else is telling, telling the, the story, story and he's verifying it. Uh, so I know the story. <laughs> you know what, and it's funny because I never heard this story until Cher and Leon told it. Wow. And I wish my father was around to, I would, just to ask those questions, like what happened? Yeah, exactly. And I never heard it until then. And here, there, here's the clip with Leon Russell uh, talking about a session. Can you name the piano player in all of these songs? Gentle on my mind. Little old lady. When I was playing as a side man, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything to anybody about anything. Unless I happened to know the arranger or the producer, then I'd say something if I had an idea. But normally, I didn't know anybody. And I just kept my mouth shut. He had that magic touch on the piano. I don't know what you call down home, southern style piano playing that he did. It was magnificent. And I was so taken with Al DeLore and his capability. And he put Al, later on, he put Al playing electric piano, yeah. which was just a fill kind of, I mean, just something to fill up the sound, with Leon Russell playing the acoustic piano. And I said, gee, you know, I thought Al was great. And he says, no, Leon Russell, man, he's got hands. He can reach octaves yeah, with right. his, you can't, you can't beat that. I figured out early on that if I wanted to be heard on the record, I had to play high. So I always played high. And all those high parts on those Phil's records, it's me. I did that so I could be heard. If you don't do that, you get lost you know, in the wall, so to speak. Leon never said boo to anybody, you know. He'd just come in, play his piano, you know. And so one day, he came to work completely, completely drunk. I mean, so drunk, so drunk. And he went in, and he sat down at the piano, and he and and who was playing next to him? Don Randy, I think. 
And everybody, I mean, he was actually talking. He never spoke. And everybody was like coming in, did you see, did you see Leon, did you see Leon? And so everyone was like just looking at him, you know, and he was being really funny too, because I never heard him say a word. So Philip was like totally knocked out, but then finally he wanted the session to begin, you know, and, and Leon was just doing, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. And so Philip said, you know, Leon, have you ever heard of the word respect? And Leon jumped up on the table, on the piano, and he said, Philip, have you ever heard of the word <laughs> you? And everybody, I mean, that was, the, I mean, we, they couldn't get it together for half an hour. People were like dying on the floor. I mean, tears rolling in the studio because it was just, it was one of those, you know, the weirdest thing you ever saw. The story, the way Cher told it, the Phil Spector story, that's absolutely accurate. First of all, Tommy was there that day that I did that horrible drunk bonanza on top of the piano at Phil Spector. The next day, Tommy came over to my apartment and said, Leon, said, I want you to go on the road and preach. I'll pay for the whole thing. I'll buy the buses, I'll buy the trucks, I'll pay for every dime of expenses, and you just give me a percentage back to pay me back. We were on this day with Glenn Campbell, and they brought <laughs> Leon in, and I'll never forget. And Leon panicked, he was sitting there, and, and Glenn says, Leon, just play that shit you did in Oklahoma. He says, he says they don't know nothing here. So Leon, <laughs> Leon played Leon Russell, yeah, right. and all of a sudden, they don't know nothing. That was his style. That's what they yeah. loved. That's what he did from there on it. I'd play those sessions. We'd play tracks. We have chord sheets, so we'd play the tracks. Sometimes we'd play them ten times before we ever heard the melody, heard the singer. Just out of boredom, I'd write songs to those tracks as they was going by. You know, those are the surprises I didn't know about over the, you know, 19 years of making the film. Things like that, I loved. And you, I'm sure you learned a lot about your father and, and just everything just all at once. The just amazing multiplicity of stories. Yeah. And, you know, and um, when we get into the second part of, of, of the, uh, the Wrecking Crew, we'll talk in more detail about, you know, the people and, Great. and individual stories and even the music business and some other surprises too. So. I'm here with Danny Tedesco, Danny Tedesco, and this is the Now Man Show, and stay tuned for part two of the Wrecking Crew story. Glenn Campbell said, he says, I was playing with uh, Michael Jordan, but everybody in the room was Michael Jordan. Yes. They were like, boom, 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 boom. You know, countdown, let's get it out. Phil Spector's Wall of Sound. Yeah. You know, you got Janet Dean using the guys. Janet Dean turns them on to Brian Wilson. And all this stuff starts, and now they become the guys. They become the A-team. 1972, I get a call from Ben Barrett at the beginning of the year. Hey, Don, listen, Motown is moving from Detroit, and they want a band, and I want you to be a staff musician. They had a big act in those days called Martin Denny. It was exotic sounds from Hawaii, piano player. And uh, so I'd put in the bird deck, the bird sounds and the cuckoos. And your father was on uh, the Gong Show. The Gong Show was, a, was supposed to be as a joke. 